So welcome to this open talk, Global Toxic Waste, Slow Violence and Contaminated Soil, a conversation on Arica at the Nordic Institute of Latin American Studies. We, Azucena Castro and Gianfranco Selgas, are doctoral and postdoctoral researchers in Latin American literature and culture and the environmental humanities at the Department of Roman Studies and Classics, and will moderate this talk. Uh, we have the pleasure to introduce uh, our guests, uh, William Yuanson Calais and Lars Ekman, uh, co film directors of the documentaries B. Barnum or Toxic Playground in English uh, from 2010 and Arika, uh, recently released in 2020. Yes, so as you can see now, um, well, so now we'll show just like uh, the, the trailer of Arika. Um, just to give you a flavor, uh, if you haven't had a chance to, uh, to watch the film, the documentary, um, or just to see um, uh, the trailer, here it is. Um, so um, as I said, right, this, um, this open talk will uh, devote itself to talk about Arica. Um, and, you know, this cinematographic production deals with uh, the events occurred in the mid 1980s, uh, when the Swedish mining company Boliden shipped a toxic cargo containing hazardous waste material such as arsenic and lead produced in Sweden to be dumped in Arica, Chile, a place located between the Atacama Desert and the Pacific Ocean. Well, the toxic waste was supposed to be um, received and treated by the Chilean company Plomel. Instead, it laid open on the ground in haze used as playground by children in nearby communities, where also the wind carries out particles of the toxic waste and where the rain slowly led arsenic, lead, cadmium and mercury closer to the groundwater and the living depending on it. So the intention and, and our plan, I mean, uh, given the failure of the webinar uh, is basically that Susana and I will, uh, will prepare some questions to ask uh, William and Lash about Arica mainly, uh, but definitely as you will see throughout the conversation, uh, both films, Arica and uh, Blue Barton or Toxic Playground are related. Um, so the, the questions will relate to each other, right? Um, so the idea is to do that. Um, uh, the chat is open, so you guys can write. If you have questions and you want to pose them, uh, please go ahead and do it. Uh, but, we'll, but we will attend those questions um, maybe the last 20 minutes of the talk, um, okay? So that will be pretty much the, uh, the, the, the procedure. And um, uh, we hope that you know, the, uh, the questions will lead to a, a fruitful conversation and dialogue with uh, William and Lash. So, um, Azucena, back to you. Uh, yeah, so um, your first documentary, Blee Barnum, or Toxic Playground, focuses on the shipment of toxic waste from Sweden to Chile and its impact on the population of Arica, including children. Uh, whereas Toxic Playground peels back at the layers of this scandal, it seems to us that the documentary Arica, uh, the perspective is broadened to include the effects of toxic waste in the whole region. So can you comment on how your preoccupation with this topic started in Sweden like around 15 years ago and uh, the connections that you see or you established as film directors between Toxic Playground uh, in 2010 and Arica now from 2020? And, and you can uh, start the way you want. Stop sharing. Yes. Uh, do you want to start, Lars? Uh, well, we can start to talk about how, how we get got to know about this problem. We were both uh, students at uh, Folkhögskola, popular university, uh, which was uh, held for mainly Swedish students uh, and a big part of the students in that course had roots uh, in Latin America. Um, it was held in Valparaiso in 2004 and 2005 and we were there for about a year. In this course uh, we were given different uh, projects to, to work on and when we had the opportunity to begin to work on a larger project, a longer project, uh, me and William were actually approached by our teacher who told us about um, Arica and uh, Boliden's uh, actions there uh, in the mid 80s. We had heard about this. This was already like old news 
in 2004. It was up in the media in, in uh, 98, around that time, I believe. Uh, so it kind of ring the bell <laughs> uh, with us, but we didn't really know so much about it. So uh, we soon decided to travel to Arica, which is in the far north of Chile, uh, pretty long way from, from Santiago and Valparaiso. And made contact with some, uh, with, um, uh, some local authorities there and pretty soon got in contact with people in, uh, in the affected area mm -hmm. and began to, to film, to take their testimonies, really. Um, and we soon realized that this is something that we need to, uh, to continue to follow uh, and do, because we only produced like a short uh, in, the, in the time of the, the film school, uh, a 30 minute production or something like that. But, uh, and we're only like in the area in Narika, but really soon realized that we have to go uh, and take this further and also investigate and start to see uh, the, the Swedish side of it all. What happened? How, how could it be that uh, this, these toxic wastes arrived in Arica in the mid 80s? And so that was kind of the start of, of the work with uh, what was to be toxic playground. Mm -hmm. William? Yeah, yeah and, and I'm <coughs> continuing then to, to Arica. I mean, the, the big difference there is actually that, uh, uh, yeah. There was this environmental lawyer, Louis Gordon, who saw a toxic playground. And all, all the time when we were working with toxic playground, everybody that we talked to, they told us that uh, this is something you can discuss from a, like a moral po point of view. But because this was during the 80s and the, the environmental laws were not the same and uh, it's not possible to try this legally. Uh, but Louis Gordon, uh, told us that yes, it is possible to try it legally. Uh, we will try to sue Bolivia. It, it will be very difficult. Uh, a lot of technical issues that needs to be sorted out, but it is possible. And we got the possibility to follow that from the inside, which I mean, of course, we <laughs> we had to do. Uh, so from our point of view, it's actually we we are very much specialists in. <laughs> in the Arica case and, 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 and the problems, uh, the environmental problems that you have in Arica. Uh, but from um, showing the uh, Toxic Playground and also this new film, uh, we have also got to learn about and talk to other to people in other places in, in Chile uh, that this is part of a, you know, you, you have other kinds of, of similar environmental uh, problems on other places. You have this uh, that they call Zonas uh, de Sacrificio, uh, which is like zones uh, that is uh, contaminated and uh, you know uh, the government doesn't really do that much to help the people who, who lives in these zones. So, uh, of course, we hope that our films uh, can also give some ideas and some tools and uh, thoughts for people in other places with this kind of problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one, one thing that, that, uh, that we have learned and that you can learn from the film is the importance of uh, getting evidence for, for you know, whatever happens, examines for your, your illnesses, uh, tests for like blood tests and urine tests, uh, and also uh, soil tests uh, to know, and also to, to, to take things to court as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. because it will be more difficult the longer the time it takes. That's um, it's. I mean, it's. I think it's interesting to uh, to see and to draw connections between what the documentaries do, 
and the implications these films have with uh, the environmental discourse in Sweden and Scandinavia. So we're, we are wondering if uh, there are implications if the films you produce um, are in a way trying to uh, sort of a discuss and, and kind of a rethink uh, ecological thinking and environmental thinking in Sweden and Scandinavia. I think that's, uh, I mean, at least as and I, when we watch the films, we're thinking about that constantly, right? Given that Sweden and Scandinavia in general have uh, this important approach to the environment uh, and the film seems to show the other side of that, so. Yeah, I mean, um, Sweden has the image of being this uh, like humanitarian and superpower and, and you know, with a big conscience and also in the forefront when it comes to environmental issues. And that's also what uh, the people in, in, in this area, in this community in Arica, but how could, how could a company from Sweden, how could Sweden do this? Um, and I mean, that is something that I think a lot of Swedish people have has that, they, they have that uh, uh, thought as well. And I mean, in some way it is also correct. I mean, we have people like Greta Thunberg and there is a lot of people doing a lot of really good stuff and also good companies. And uh, so that exists, but there is also uh, this side. Uh, and uh, I think it is very important for a Swedish public to, to get that as well and to, to, to don't be too naive uh, about, about that. And just and just take a step back and and uh, like really consider the actions of of, uh, of our companies. And I think it's kind of testimonial this work that we now uh, spent fifteen years uh, doing. I think it uh, at least uh, in some way did that. Um, just taking taking uh, the the public here in where I'm sitting now in Sleftio, the region where Bullion is like the most important and have been the most important company for a long time. When we started with this project, people were really like defensive and saying that you know no not not Bullion we uh, we don't really believe that they did anything wrong uh, or have caused this even. So it's really valuable to to be able to spend so much time uh, covering a subject and being able to not say that yes, it is something wrong, but at least give a new perspective and uh, the people the opportunity to, to share that perspective as well. Mm -hmm. And um, regarding your role as filmmakers and, and documentary as a, as a tool, um, what do you think uh, is the political potential of documentary uh, as an aesthetic media to denounce and register the traces of toxicity and the annihilation of lives in this case in Arica and other parts of Latin America? And we were also thinking uh, about this long tradition of denunciatory documentary film in the region. I don't know if you were uh, thinking about that. Latin America has a long tradition of documentary to denounce uh, social environmental problems. Um, so that's, that's our uh, concern. Like, how do you think about using documentary as an aesthetic media to pose those, pro those problems and to visualize this, uh, this, uh, this concern? I, I think it's been a, a, a very good tool um, because uh, when it comes to this case, I mean, there's been a lot of reports, uh, a lot of news reports, a lot of written reports, a lot of TV. And I mean, it's not bad journalism, not bad reports, but it's just so much that you can do during a short, if you're doing a news piece in two, two minutes and you have a certain amount of time to, to, to do something, it will be very difficult for you to explain the complicity of, of it all. Uh, so for us being able to follow this for 15 years uh, and uh, it, it makes it possible to, to take the audience both explain the difficult circumstances but also take them on, on uh, an, an emotional journey so that you don't only understand what it's all about but you can also feel it um, almost like that you're living it yourself. 
so in that way, I think uh, documentaries, they are a, a, a great uh, tool. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, it's lovely to be part of, of a, a, a tradition like that. <laughs> and we, we have understood also from the times and we have been in the, because we have always gone to the community to show the films. Um, and it's always well attended, uh, always great discussions. We are actually a bit sad that uh, uh, this time uh, we were planning to, to go to the community and have uh, free open air screenings of the film uh, of Arika, uh, which we will do, but we had to postpone it because of, of the pandemic. But uh, we're now looking into the possibility to have uh, a cinema release in Chile and uh, at that time also have the special open air screenings in, in the area. Mm -hmm. And also, because you mentioned this uh, Sonas de Sacrificio earlier on, William, um, so we're also having talks with distributors in Chile and to like make a tour through Chile and maybe like with some uh, targeting these kind of communities and areas and show the film. And I think it's, it's really powerful and, and uh, helpful as a tool to like just open maybe uh, people seeing the perspectives of others but be able to to connect it to themselves and their lives I think it can be very very helpful and now in Chile I mean the the people and the society is really waking up to different kind of issue with this democratization process uh, and new constitution coming on and everything I really hope that uh, in, in some way can be part uh, in, uh, in that. And we know that, that already uh, in this community, uh, some people have gotten, um, uh, uh, you know, into documentary filmmaking uh, after this. Mm -hmm. uh, the, some people did a short, documentary style film from uh, the place where the, the waste is now. Uh, and they call it uh, uh, El Cementerio Sueco, the Swedish cemetery, uh, which is and it, it's a quite beautiful film with the, from, from the perspective of some women in, in the area where they talk about this and what they think about it. Uh, we got it sent to us and we have it. Uh, if somebody is interested to see it, you can find it. We have a, a Facebook page called Arika, a toxic waste scandal. In there, uh, it's possible to, to find all kinds of, of news and uh, things that's happening. Uh, there you can also find a, a link uh, where it's uploaded there. Uh, this short film, it's like five minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. a documentary. Amazing, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I mean that's definitely th something we have to uh, to check out. And I think that I mean the, the question again about uh, the implication of the community. Um, it's it's absolutely important in the way that they have reacted right to what has happened based on what the film has been doing for fifteen years. Um, if it's okay with you, I just want to go back to um, the the issue of this kind of an unequal and sort of a neo-colonial relation between the global south and the global north, right? Given that this is an issue that involves uh, Sweden and, and Chile, right? Being representative of these two kind of main and big areas of division of the world. And I mean, the question we have, I know it's a bit abstract, um, but you know, we're wondering how does, you know, the documentaries, and I'm thinking about Toxic Playground and Arika as well, um, highlight the global chain of production and waste disposal. And, you know, we're, we're thinking about the lithium extraction, this sort of a, new heavy metals that have been, you know, it's part of the new extractivist chain in Latin America that in a, in a sense is calling for going back to new extractive activities in Latin America. So it's not over. Um, and again, the question we have is how is this documentary? And, and I mean, I guess it's a question that we can broaden to other documentaries that work, you know, as uh, sort of a denun denunciatory films. 
um, how do they highlight these issues? Yeah, I'm, um, I think this is a, a very good example <laughs> of uh, what, what uh, I think it was a, a, a activist at Greenpeace who coined the expression uh, toxic colonialism, mm. uh, which is, I mean, when richer countries, for example, if they dump toxic waste or if they uh, extract something in a way that, that will uh, harm the people uh, in that country. There, like you say, there, there, there is a lot of, of, of uh, examples. Uh, another one, I mean, uh, the problem with the e-waste that is sent and uh, people starting to, to um, uh, working it with their hands, usually very poor people, and uh, they have the possibility then to earn some money and to be able to get some food but they will get sick. So they sort of have to uh, they have to decide between getting some small money or having the health, which is horrible, horrible. Um, and um, in, when, when it comes to this, uh, one thing that I think is sort of interesting in, in when, when it comes to shipping your, your waste, I mean, there's so much to discuss uh, inside of <laughs> all this, obviously. But when it comes to shipping this waste, uh, we have been working with an organization, or I mean, we have been screening and talking and, you know, uh, they are called uh, the Basel Action Network. Because there is uh, something called the Basel Agreement. Convention. Yes, the, the Basel Convention. Uh, that is supposed to prohibit richer countries to send their waste to poorer countries, basically. But the problem with it is that if the receiving country, if the, uh, the, 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 the guys in charge in the receiving countries says that, that it's okay, then it's okay to, 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 to send it, even if people get uh, harmed. So this, the ba Basel Action Network, they are trying to get something that they call, uh, call the ban amendment, which makes it uh, impossible, even if the politician on the receiving side uh, says that, 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 they, that they want to take it. Uh, and uh, uh, we were at the UN sh showing uh, toxic playground and having discussions uh, about this uh, together with, with them. Uh, it was in 2018. Uh, and uh, I mean, they have been working very hard and it has actually come into action now, the, the ban amendment, but only for the countries that have signed it. So, so it's like, uh, uh, 20 or 30 countries or something that have signed it. But a lot of, of the big polluting countries, for example, the United States and Canada and many others, they have not signed it. So that, that is, I mean, there's a lot of, of uh, <laughs> fights and discussions going on uh, about how to, how to, to manage this kind of toxic colonialist uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, and our films, we, we absolutely think that they are uh, a good example of, I mean, it, it is uh, a case among many cases of this type. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, thank you. Like we were, uh thinking about what you said before this, uh, but uh, I think we think the, the film highlights this sacrifice places or places where uh, it, it is possible to, uh, to, to contaminate, to uh, intoxicate people without uh, not, not being accountable for, for your actions. Uh, and, and, and it's a process that goes on under a long, long time and it's almost imperceptible. 
also um, uh, there is an environmentalist uh, scholar in the in environmental humanities that is called Rob Nixon, and uh, he uh, talks about slow violence. Uh, that is an ongoing violence that is almost imperceptible, and it's affecting mostly precarious and poor areas, and that is related to extractive practices and, uh, and to capitalism. Um, how do you think your film puts into view this uh, almost imperceptible uh, um, violence and maybe testifies about about this um, uh, this process that is going on has been going on since the 80s and that that is almost imperceptible but that has um, affected the lives of uh, people and, and non-human entities under a long long time and will do it into the future we don't know uh, when this uh, toxicity will uh, cease to exist um, so we were just wondering uh, how uh, how you see the, the film's function in showing this uh, violence that is almost imperceptible. Um, I hadn't really heard that term before, actually, uh, until I read it in your in your email. But uh, I mean, I think it's really spot on in this case. It's exactly what this is all about. It's been thirty five years now since the shipments. And uh, we who have uh, followed this in the news or have seen the film uh, know how it ended up exactly in this, uh, in this way, uh, which really demonstrates this, this slow violence. There aren't legal, uh, legal opportunities for these people either mm -hmm. to follow up or, or, or be... Uh, or, or hold, hold uh, the company, in this case, accountable. So I think, I mean, this is obviously a, a good example of, of this slow violence. Uh, and it's also been described uh, to us from the people in Marika, how they, how we've seen it, I mean, for so many years now, how people live and how they fight and how they don't get listened to by authorities and companies. Um, so yeah, uh, sadly, I think <laughs> Arika and, and Toxic Playground fits yeah. fits really into that description. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, there is a big problem with this time bar issue, which, which was the issue here in the in the appeal court. Mm -hmm. uh, the Swedish court decided that this was too long ago; you can't really try it anymore. Time has passed, even though we know the consequences are. Mm. They are there, but probably still yet to see. Um, but I believe there was a uh, William. You're a bit maybe familiar with the PFAS. Uh... It was actually the, the same uh, lawyers or two of them, uh, Johan Nöberg uh, and uh, Jonas Arkebo. Uh, they were part of another huge trial uh, about PFAS which is in um, uh, fire extinguisher, the foam. And also in, uh, I think it's in Teflon. And, uh, but in this case, it was specifically the, the foam from the fire extinguisher. Uh, this was in Bleking in Sweden. Uh, and they, they won that case. Uh, uh, and they won it on the, uh, the way uh, the court accepted that the the harm was not there. I mean, they were not already sick, mm. but, but knowing what this kind of, of chemicals can do to your body, uh, they could get damages. Mm -hmm. so, so that was actually a quite big step forward for, uh, for this kind of issues. I think uh, one thing that, that I thought about when I heard about it, I also uh, asked uh, Yuan, because in the film, for, for those of you who have seen it, Yuan Erberg, the, the lawyer, he says that, so what, what do you think would have happened if you put this, if you have, would have put this pile of toxic waste just some meters outside of a, a residential area in Uppsala? Because Uppsala, it's 
more or less the same amount of people living in Uppsala as in Arica. Would they get away with it then? I mean, probably not. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, one big part of, of, of the reason for uh, the lawyers being successful in this court case uh, about PFAS was obviously because it was uh, uh, harming people in Sweden, in Blekinge, not in Arika, on like the other side of, of the world. Um, so, but I mean, hopefully, it's a step in the right. It is a step in the right direction, and hopefully, it can definitely. also m mean that people in in other countries can benefit from these types of interpretations, and that you don't have to actually have the evidence of, of sickness, or, or you can just see that yes, we can expect this from these types of uh, pollutions and contaminations, mm -hmm. so that there can be a. Uh, you know, like a faster response to this slow violence than there is actually. Mm -hmm. That's just got me thinking about like environmentalisms that matter. Like when uh, when a, a discourse is about the environment matter, it, they matter in uh, in Sweden, in the global north, and the, the other environmentalisms that don't matter. The bodies that are testifying of uh, toxicity and uh, and harm, but they but their claims are not hard. Um, in this uh, colonial division that still exists, right? Um, I give the word to, yeah. Jean but it's, it's uh, just to comment on the, yeah. the time bar issue because the lawyers uh, representing the Arika victims were actually, you know, they were going for using Chilean law because the time bar in Chilean law regarding environmental issues is actually more liberal than, than Swedish law. In Swedish law, uh, you measure the, the clock for the time bar begins to run uh, when the action is carried out, the harmful action, in this case, sending the waste or the waste is received. And then the time starts ticking, 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason for them wanting to use Chilean law in this case was that in Chile, it's, the time starts when you can present some time kind of harm. Mm. That is, for example, when you receive a, a test result uh, saying that you have X amount of arsenic in your, in your urine. Uh, so that's a bit mm. interesting, just talking about law and, and uh, what opportunities and possibilities there are uh, that in some, uh, in some way, at least in this case, uh, Chile is, is actually more advanced than Sweden in, in handling these types of cases. But I mean, then there are tons of other issues uh, implementing people in Arica to, to gain access to that. Mm -hmm. uh, taking yeah. it to court and all that thing. But, uh, but it's quite an interesting thing. Yeah, I mean... If, and we hope, uh, I mean, it would be lovely to, to have this kind of... that the, If the film could take this question up for discussion and it is really is it okay that we have this kind of law mm. uh, like it's said in the in the film you bury a toxic uh, toxic no. for and then you hold your breath for 10 years and just hope that nothing happens in those 10 years and then it's right yeah i think uh william i don't know if you want to say something or no i mean just uh common that um that uh, 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 that in Sweden today, uh, children can be born and they they do not have the possibility to 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 uh, to speak in the court. I mean, their claims have been time barred before they are born. So I mean, how that can be uh, considered to be. In, in line with the, with the basic human rights. I mean, that's really strange for me. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, I mean, uh, uh, as you know, Slash was saying, I think it's very like poetically put, you know, the way you have said that you have to hold your breath for 10 years and see if it's affecting you or not. And I think what the documentaries uh, do, and that's at least from our take, and I'm speaking for, you know, for a center myself, 
uh, the, the political uh, like foundation of the documentary is basically that he's in a way doing what the law didn't do, which is basically showing that after that amount of time, uh, we can show that that toxic waste is still affecting the people. So um, I guess, and this is the last question uh, we have because I think we're actually uh, managing the time uh, quite good in those terms, uh, is that if you guys can consider uh, the documentaries as, as a sort of a, um, um, the, the memory of toxic waste. And if that is something, if you consider the documentary as, as like a bearer of, of memories of toxic waste, um, how do these intervene? And I think you guys have answered that question already. How have they intervened in the uh, in in Justin and in terms of, of of human rights? I mean, how are these documentaries in a way uh, helping to change or to contest what law isn't doing in in some sense? You want to start, Lars? Or... I thought I knew. <laughs> uh, no, uh, absolutely. I, I mean. Uh, one of the main things that we want to do with our film is uh, we want people to, to see the film. Uh, we want them to make their own opinion about uh, how justice works. I mean, justice is extremely important and the legal system is like the crown jewel in our democracies in many ways. It's really, really important. It's something we need to discuss. discuss. It's not something we we need to tweak. It's something we all the time need to to to, to talk about. Uh, so we want people to 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 talk about how and for whom justice works. And uh, I mean that that is our role <laughs> as documentary filmmakers as well. We. Um, we we will not go in and really come with any suggestions how, how to tweak them. We can we, we we hope that there will be smart people following this and <laughs> do that. But what we hope is that people see the film and start discussing this. Um, there is a, a beautiful quote also. When um, when the lawyers received this verdict the first time. Uh, Louis Gordon, uh, this was actually part of some of the rough cuts of the film that we did, but you know, our first rough cut of the film was over four hours long, so we <laughs> had to take away a lot of stuff, good and bad stuff. This was a very beautiful thing that we couldn't fit anywhere, but uh, so, uh, but Louis Gordon said that uh, he wanted to quote Martin Luther King when they uh, talked about losing this case because he said it is really important that people continue to take the fight, continue to try to 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 do these lawsuits, to test this. Uh, and they said that Martin Luther King once said, "The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice," which I think is a very nice. Uh, thing to have have in the back of, of your mind when 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 uh, the world seems a bit dark. Yeah, that was a that was a really really inspiring quote. Um, well, we we would like to open the floor for uh, some questions or comments uh, from 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 the audience, the ones that are listening. Um, you will not be able, I think, to show your cameras, but uh, you are definitely allowed to uh, write on the chat. And I'm not sure if they are allowed to put on the phones. I'm not sure about that uh, in this type of seminar. Uh, but you're definitely welcome to write questions or comments or impressions uh, on the on the chat. Uh, yeah, I think we have at least we have one question, and we, we can take that one and um, and then see if someone else want, wants to say something. Susanna said you're very welcome to ask questions, and you know we still have at least twelve minutes, um, so you know let's take advantage of it. So the question is uh, is from David, and you know, he's asking that how do the panelists think that the new global extractivism policies, given the green policies in industrialized countries, can affect more and more 
to countries closer to us. So I think I dropped out a bit uh, when you read the question. Can you please, could you please repeat it? Yeah, for sure. Um, how do you think that the new global extractivist policies, given the green policies in industrialized countries can affect more and more countries closer to us? So, so meaning like in general, uh, sort of the movements towards uh, more green, uh, uh, more uh, higher like environmental uh, laws and st standards is that uh... yes he's saying that's it's it's like that yeah yeah no i mean that that's that's it uh that's uh, one of the most important things <laughs> uh for for the world to be better uh that we make stuff that harms people illegal uh, and um I think it is a long way and as long as there is uh, like very big uh, financial gains in doing stuff the bad way that will continue so going in and um, uh, strength strengthening the legislations uh, that will save lives and especially now when we are uh, in a phase where uh, because of the global warming we will need all these uh, different metals and we know that they are many times in vulnerable areas and we know that uh, it can be very toxic and dangerous working these minerals but we also know that but that we really need it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think this is a, 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 a extra important time for us to 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 be aware and to have open eyes and really uh, be sure that uh, that the whole line is is okay. That nobody gets hurt uh, in any way. And I, I think I mean the legislations are key to to it. Uh, for it to work. We are actually um, hoping and planning to screen uh, Arika here in uh, Sleftio and in Sleftio Ham, uh, which is where the Rönnsjär factory is situated. Uh, and Sleftio Ham is also the place for this new gigantic battery factory, Notevolt, maybe you heard of it. Uh, so I was just thinking now we should uh, also invite <laughs> some representatives from, from Northwatt to take part of the screening and discussion afterwards because it's, I mean, that's like the big next, the next Boolean of the region will be. Uh, so it should be really interesting to, uh, to invite them and hear their thoughts about this, this chain, chain of production. Uh, yeah, we, we have another question. Uh, we, uh, we have several questions. I'm going to start in, in order, uh, just to, not to miss anyone. Like Patricio uh, is asking, uh, well, he's saying congratulations for the documentary. It is a great work. I would like to know what is the situation today in Arica? Do you know what are the people doing today to hold Bully even accountable for this crime? So uh, they have done uh, they are trying to demonstrate in, in every possible way. Right now in the pandemic, uh, Chile is in uh, lockdown, so it's, very, it's a bit difficult for them to, 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 to do anything. But where the waste is right now, they have made these paintings and uh, they are calling it uh, the Swedish cemetery, uh, El Cemeterio Sueco. And uh, they are doing different actions all the time. Also, we know that uh, Rodrigo, he went to meet with the Swedish uh, embassy, uh, pushing for Sweden to help uh, with health and also uh, with uh, uh, bringing this, because the waste is still there. And uh, the idea is that in Boliden, as for the people who have seen the film, 
underneath the big uh, factory, uh, Rönnskär, they have built this huge uh, storage room, 300 meters down in, in, in the mountain, uh, to store this kind of really toxic waste. So uh, the people in Arika are saying that, you know, <laughs> there is a great place for this waste. It's not here, but it's, you know, where it came from. So that is something that they are, are uh, pushing for very hard at, at this time. We have um, another question by Jordan. The question is about the community of Arika. Jordan says, I noticed that some of the interview participants in the first documentary, Blay Barnett, used Quichua words, for example, Wawa for child or baby. Uh, being so close to Bolivia, I am wondering if the community affected has a noticeable indigenous population and if there is also a layer of contested land claims. And as a follow up, how does Arica compare to other areas in Chile in terms of the intensity of and distribution of environmental bats? Uh, so the Wawa thing, I think uh, because of the proximity to both Peru and Bolivia, I mean, Arica is, <laughs> it's almost like more Bolivian and Peruvian than Chilean because there's really a, long long distance to the power in the central like you know governments in, in uh, Santiago. Uh, I don't know anything about uh, the land grabbing issues uh, and such but just I mean lingual wise there's a lot of influx from from those regions uh, which you uh, get to know <laughs> when you spend a lot of time in Arica. And they have some really nice, you, you know, the what's it called, the the carnival things, uh, with with a lot of Peruvian, uh, uh, with, with dancing and the music and uh, a lot of influences from the neighbors. What was the follow-up question again? Yeah, the follow-up was um, how does Arica compare to other areas in Chile in terms of the intensity of and distribution of environmental bats? Um, not sure, uh, to be honest. Uh, we have mainly focused our work in, in this region, in Narika. Uh, but we do know that there are several cases uh, of mining uh, being handled very badly and still, that's still go ongoing uh, in the north. And I think that, as I said, the distance to Santiago uh, is uh, something that is like uh, making this possible. I think the control maybe isn't uh, what it could be in, in other regions, uh, but then again, not knowing how this control is carried out in other regions. But I have the impression that uh, uh, environmental focus and uh, uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't been taken uh, care of in a good way in this region now. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a question uh, by Susan. She asks, uh, from an academic perspective, filmmaking is used more and more as a tool to include starring participants as active parts of the film, make, of the filmmaking process. Was this the case in the Arica film? Does Arica dwellers, uh, or do you think that if Arica dwellers have the opportunity to lead the film in some way, um, thanks for an excellent film. Uh, so if I understood it, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the, so the, the, yeah, I mean, for us uh, having Lars, I mean, Lars is the main protagonist in, in the film and uh, that opens up the possibility for us to, I, I think, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant way to connect to many different audiences because he has the, this very special connection and bond both to Chile and to, to Northern Sweden. Uh, and it was also very important for us to, in the beginning of the film, have like a kind of disclaimer from from Lars, getting his point of view before the film starts, uh, which is, uh, for example, in, in the interview with uh, uh, 
where uh, Jocelyn, the young girl, is interviewing Lars and asking him what he thinks about this. So it's kind of a very easy way, but it shows that he's friends with, with the people and he thinks it is something wrong and he, he wants to follow this up. Um, I didn't really understand. Does Arika Dwellers have the opportunity to lead the film in some way? If you think that the, I think it, I, let me interpret your question, Susan. I'm sorry. I, I think the question is um, about like, if you think that the, um, if you thought when you were making the film that uh, the, the uh, community and dwellers were part, were also like protagonists in the film, uh, not just ours, but that part of the, of the film, or if they made suggestions maybe that the, how you would film or what you would film, and if you maybe follow those suggestions or um, mm -hmm. how was their participation in the process? Yes, yeah, of course, ah, then I understand. No, I mean, uh, uh, it was very important for us. And uh, it was very important for us uh, that the people, all, all the people in front of the camera are subjects with the uh, uh, agenda, uh, a motive. Uh, and um, it is a bit special because for us as filmmakers, uh, we kind of God also, you know, it, it need we, we can't, uh, it, it, you know, it's many different layers of it. Uh, one is also the sort of the journalistic part of it that, that we need to, we, we come with an with a, with a angle it's kind of it's our film. We, we need to follow it because and we are the one who needs to stand behind it. But it was, of course, very important for us that everybody in the film could recognize themselves and that they felt that it was a, a, a picture uh, that was true. Mm -hmm. And it was also very important for us that, that it should work in, uh, with many different audiences. So that, that the people in the community, that they could take it as, as their film. So we had a lot of special screenings for people in Chile and uh, in Arica uh, during the, the, the process. Uh, but I mean, that was also very much to, to, to understand if everything is understandable. Uh, so also like, you know, uh, everything from legal stuff to cultural Swedish stuff to just to, to know that, that the film will, will work with uh, many different audiences. I'm sure if I, I answered. <laughs> <I'll try that. laughs> I think you have. Uh, I think we have time for at least one more question. Um, Lucas um, says, well, thank you for a great film and interesting talk. Um, he has a question common about naivety. Uh, one thing that really struck me while seeing Toxic Playground was the naivety of Sweden, thinking that military Chile will take proper care of the waste. Then comes Basel, but you can bypass it with bilateral agreements. So comes the ban amendment, uh, but it is not signed. So the question is, in environmental issues, do you experience this is about naivety or genuine inability to see things outside of your own perspective, not just geographically, but also culturally? I think it's uh, I think it's a matter of what you think is important. I mean, this kind of legislations uh, you will always have. It's like two two scolds or you know uh, weights. <laughs> so <laughs> scolds to <it's, it's> English, <laughs> um, and uh, then it's a matter of what you think is most important. I mean, one thing is uh, that companies uh, need to have the possibility to, to plan their uh, businesses and to make money for people to go to work and yada, yada, all of that. I mean, that is important. And then on, on the other way, it is uh, the health of people, uh, uh, human rights, the, the right for, for, uh, for life and for, uh, and that, that will always be the thing when, when you do the legislations. And I think in order for this weight to, to be important uh, is to show, show it. I mean, that, that's also kind of what, what we're trying to do. Uh, that if, this, if, if you put too much weight on, on this, I mean, of 
course it's important for we need businesses but you can't do business if that means that people will get hurt and that they will die uh, and i think it will always be a struggle uh, for legislators to come up with with laws and then companies trying to bypass them and people will always be greedy and it will always be a struggle uh, but i also think that we as a community always need to take that fight and need to um, i mean we, we don't have any 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 choice but it, it's and i mean and it's also i mean good comment because the na nativity of uh, i mean is really obvious to us as well during toxic playground and I mean, Rolf as a, as a character and uh, his, his decisions. But, I mean, like William says, it can't, then it's our like duty to <laughs> not let these naive people and have like this, I don't know, uh, lack of knowledge uh, make this uh, like this kinds of decision. It can't be based on just pure nativity and, uh, and these things we need better control than that obviously yeah. i mean if if the uh, if the, the end result is that people are harmed and that people die or get get ill then that needs to be uh, stopped i mean that that needs to be legislated uh, no matter if it's because they were naive or if it was because uh, they did it without, I mean, carry. And I think uh, we have some, yeah, yeah that's fine. No, go ahead, Lush. go ahead, sir. <laughs> now he's just going on with uh, the Rolf and his, his role. I mean, we had some uh, quite big reactions to how he has, how the lawyers, the Arika victim lawyers talk about him and his role and like this. And I mean, it, it does kind of hurt in some way it seem, but I mean, it's, Either way, it's so important to to lift it up because it's, I mean, yes, there's a person behind it all, but his decisions are so important and future decisions, decisions are so important that we can, we have to uh, raise awareness about this, these kind of, these kinds of issues. Yes, definitely. Well, I think we have uh, there's just one one last question and, and we can close with, with this. Um, this last one, maybe uh, uh, David again is asking if uh, you know about the 1998 dam crash at the Los Frailes mine in Spain. And if you know about it, can you perhaps give a brief comment on that? Uh, what similarities do you see between the cases of Arica and Los Frailes in Spain, if you know about it? Uh, of course, we've heard about it, but I don't think we're big experts on it. Uh, we know that that uh, I mean, every time when, when we were in Spain, a lot of people, <laughs> they, they recognize the name Bolidan and uh, uh, they have very negative uh, feelings about it. Because uh, from what I've understood, Bolidan uh, had this mine. Uh, and you had this dam that, that collapsed uh, and bullied and blamed uh, uh, a company working for them in Spain. And from what I have understood, bullied and didn't have to take on any responsibility in Spain either. But I, I need to say I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, not, very, not an expert on, on that uh, catastrophe. No, me neither. <laughs> well, maybe there is uh, uh, much to, to talk about and compare with other cases in, in Latin America, but maybe here in Europe too, when we see it, that this could be so far away, maybe it's, the, it's also like happening in other parts, especially in the south of Europe. Um, okay, so uh, we are really happy to have, have this talk to you and uh, we really hope that these four hours of extra material will come into a new film and maybe documentary <laughs> or a new type of film or, uh, or something else that keeps us um, uh, thinking and, and acting about these uh, catastrophes. Uh, 
man-made catastrophes and, uh, and make us aware of what is uh, happening to these uh, uh, people that maybe uh, don't have the voices to, whose voices are not heard. Uh, in the international scene. So we're really, really happy to that you could join us in this talk. And, uh, and we're really sorry for the technical problems. And, um, and I'm sure that there are some more questions, but we, we actually need to close. So thank you very much, William and uh, Lars, and all the ones that participated in the, in the talk and discussion. Uh, so yeah, we can close now. Thank you so much. Very much. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you.